When you were here for your press conference announcing your hiring as the next women's basketball head coach, you and your family interrupted a vacation, and you said you were going back to Las Vegas to finish the vacation. Absolutely. How much time did you spend actually enjoying vacation with your family, and how much time did you have your phone glued to your ear as you started to assemble a coaching staff? Well, I was, I was absolutely ordered when I went back to Las Vegas to not work and give that time to my family. Um, was hard to do. I was ordered to do it, but I'm mean, just be honest. Right now, I, I didn't follow orders. I had to text a couple people. I had to call back a couple people. But I tried to give that time to my family, so I gave them about sixteen to twenty-four hours. Your staff was announced this week. Three assistant coaches. How much? Did, how much time did you spend reaching out to candidates that you had in mind, and how many people reached out to you saying, I want to be on your staff at SMU? Well, if I had to to give percentages of who reached out to me and how much I reached out to the people that I hired, the percentage was probably would be 80-20. There was a ton of people reaching out to me uh, wanting to be a part of this opportunity which I saw it as an incredible opportunity here at SMU. But I, after I got the job, I saw how many more people saw this as a great opportunity, as a great job. Uh, but the staff that I hired, I think I couldn't have done a better job uh, with the quality of people that I've hired, uh, teachers of the game, people who's going to care about the kids. And to me, for what's important to me, that's, that's at the top. That's why I think I've, I've had, I've hired the, the best staff in the country. Mike Brandt comes over as your associate head coach after being at South Carolina Aiken, head coach for the last 14 years. What was harder, talking him into leaving a place he'd been for so long or talking him into stepping away from a head coaching position to become your associate head coach? You know, the, the, the crazy thing about it, I don't know what was the hardest. The hardest was making him realize that we can make this a reality, you know. Uh, we've talked over the years about, many times about having the opportunity to play one another in a game. We never made it to put that together. And one day I'll be a head coach and the opportunity presented itself and it wasn't hard at all actually. Uh, he was honored that I would ask him. I was honored that he would accept. So when the opportunity was real, and I presented it to him, I think we both jumped at the opportunity. And uh, it, so it make it easy because you have a, a, a man with the experience, uh, the pedigree, the passion over the years being a head coach and wanting to be a part of stepping down from a head coach's position, which you mentioned, to come and help a first time coach build a program, build something. Uh, I tilt my hat. To Mike Brandt. To fill that associate head coach role, did you look only at people who had head coach experience? Not necessarily, but the head coaching experience uh, played a vital part in me choosing in that position because they've been there, done that. They've been in a pressure situation. They made the, the final decisions, and it's hard to put a group of people who haven't done that together and expect to be able to take advantage of the short window of time that you have to, to be successful. I wanted to maximize uh, my opportunity to learn from someone who had did it before. But I do have another young lady who's on staff who had head coaching experience as well. She's just not my associate head. One of your other assistant coaches, Edwina Brown, legendary player at Texas. Mm -hmm. um, Second to me. I'm sorry? Second to me. Second to you, right. <laughs> Becomes the second Coach Brown coaching basketball at SMU at the moment. And you reached across the Metroplex and stole her away from TCU. What is it about her that made you go after her? What, I know she's your recruiting coordinator, but was it more recruiting or X's and O's that made you want to add her to your staff? It's everything. It's it's the makeup of the woman. It's the makeup of the competitor. 
is the makeup of the teacher of the game. She done it at, at all levels, at a high level, at all levels. So if you're National Player of the Year at a high level, it's something about that, the way you go about your business, that if you haven't done it, you don't understand that way of thinking. It's like if we go out and play golf, the way we approach the course and you go play with a professional, he thinks and does things that you don't even think about, which makes him successful. So that part of the teaching that she brings to the game, that's going to take our program and our players to a whole nother level that I really can't explain. I think time will show what I'm talking about. Was that your first step into the SMU-TCU rivalry to go steal her off of their staff? No, I had, I had absolutely nothing to do with it. Her, Edwina and I have talked about this since we both have been in the game. Uh, she, knows I, she knows that I am a competitor. I know that she's a competitor. We always felt that one of us would have a head coaching job at some point. And we always talked about working together. And once again, there's a situation to make that reality. And, and I had that conversation with her. I said, here we go. Uh, I want to bring you on board. You may be happy where you are. I didn't think I would come and ask you to take this position without you already having a job or somewhere where you're being successful at the time, but I would love to have you a part of my staff. And once again, she did like Mike did. Um, she came on board, and I'm excited she did. The third member of your staff who you alluded to has head coaching experience, Amy Bradley, formerly of Texas, has coached in high school uh, here in Dallas uh, at Bishop Lynch, coached at Trinity University in San Antonio, What's the biggest thing she adds to your staff? Like all of my, all of my staff, uh, well-rounded. Amy's the ultimate professional. She knows the business in and out. High school, college, she's worked administration. Uh, her connection to the community, uh, her ability to teach the game. She has a passion about the game. She, she may be the best team player on my staff with the experience that she had because she's willing to do whatever it takes in order for us to be successful. Not saying that Edwina or Mike or myself wouldn't do whatever it takes for us to be successful, but that, those are the characteristics of the makeup of this staff. And that's what's exciting about uh, putting it together. And she was one that wasn't in co into coaching, but I approached her. She was honored, and she said, Travis, I'm intrigued. Absolutely. I would love and I would be honored to coach with you. And at SMU, where I'm from, I have family in Dallas. It's like a no-brainer. So I, I'm batting a 1,000 right now, so you're looking at a very happy man. Someone who's not so happy, sort of. I spoke last week with Karen Aston your former boss at, at Texas, and she was very gracious about you, said she was enormously happy and proud of you for getting this job. She also said there was a conversation where she asked, what would it take to keep you in Austin? What was that conversation like? I'm I, not sure that conversation went as such. Um, she said she was going to go talk about retaining me at Texas, but the word never actually got back. And I don't know how you put that out there the way it goes across the right manner, but that's something that she would probably have to say because if I could have given her a figure, that could have very easily pulled me out of taking this opportunity because it was my alma mater. We have put together a tremendous staff. I'm going to say a tremendous team. Uh, and a lot more players that stacked up to come behind and I was at home, my home was there it wouldn't have been that difficult because the crazy part about it is I was hearing when I was interviewing that they were looking for a woman to take this job so maybe I wasn't being taken as a serious candidate 
at one point. So at that time when she came to me and, and said, you know, do I need to have a conversation? That I said, absolutely, go ahead and have that conversation and get back with me. But maybe they had heard the same thing that I heard, that I wasn't going to be a serious candidate. And that's why I was never really followed up on. So I'm excited. Uh, glad and looking forward to this opportunity. Your your last couple weeks here have been obviously very busy. You're putting together a coaching staff. You're getting ready to move your family to Dallas. And you also got to start off-season workouts with your team. When you first got on the court with your new team, what are the first kinds of things that you implement, the first kind of things you discuss about teaching the Travis Mays way of playing basketball? Well, <clears throat> the first thing was I want your best. I want you to give me maximum effort. And at that point, I know where I, I need to start when it comes to coaching you. One thing is hard to do is coach a player that's not given 100%. So I don't want to say I tricked them, but I put them in some drills where they could not give me any less. And therefore, I was seeing how they was going to get past being excited. And once you get past being excited, you have to give me maximum effort. And uh, the first thing I wanted was execution, maximum effort. And I wanted communication on the floor. Those are the first things that I really wanted. Maximum effort, execution of what we're doing, the best that you can execute, and communication with one another. At the press conference when you were hired, you said you watched several games. I think yeah. it was eight games from last year. Yeah. <clears throat> now that you've gotten on the floor just a little bit with your new team, anything surprise you about the players you're inheriting? Uh, yes. Only thing surprises me is that they're not as confident as, as I want them to be. I want them to be extremely confident. Uh, and I think that it started with maybe some nerves. It's the new coach. I don't want to mess up with the new coach. As opposed to, I'm getting ready to prove myself to this coach. I'm finna show, I'm giving him a first impression. This is what he's gonna get. Get my attention. And I, I didn't see that. I saw them more hesitant and not willing to make mistakes. So the lack of confidence surprised me. <clears throat> if settling into your new office, finding a home, putting together a staff, working out with your new players wasn't enough, it's also <laughs> recruiting season. Absolutely. You have, if my math is right, five open scholarships. Mm hmm uh, do you have a timeline in mind for when you will start signing some players? And do you expect to use all five, or could you hold some over? Well, I'm going to try and, if I'm asking my players to maximize what they do, then I have to do the same thing. So I'm going to have to try and maximize and fill those five spots. But I will not fill those five spots in players that I don't think will help us. With number one, the culture we're trying to create. And number two, um, players that, that aren't willing to max out. So I wish I could have a time frame on that, but as you know, we don't dictate when players want to come play for you uh, or when they're going to sign. That's usually done sometimes by them, their parents. They shop. They shop this thing, and sometimes they have a, a support group that's around them that have different agendas, so we can't control that. The first day that you could sign players was actually last week, mm -hmm. which was right on the heels of the press conference when you got hired. Absolutely. How much does the, the closeness of those two dates affect your ability to put together a recruiting plan and start assembling a class on short notice? It's, it's extremely tough. It's extremely tough because um, there's a lot of players that I was recruiting that was right on the brink of getting ready to commit to the University of Texas. And of course, sometimes players come to a school because of the relationship they have with you. I switch jerseys. I come to SMU. Of course, I'm going to call those players because they haven't committed, so they're open game. But some of them, well, you've sold me here. Now you want me to go here. I don't really know anything about that. Um, and sometimes it puts you behind the eight ball. You know, you go to a new school and these kids have their list narrowed down. And when you get a new job, it's usually a job that kids aren't necessarily looking at because it's probably down at that point in time. 
I have to uh, get their attention, get them excited, or probably educate them on where I am and how grand this situation can be. But they have to be kids that's not willing to go to a place that's already established, but they're willing to build a program and, and take it to the next stage. And you find those type of players, and that's what it is that we're looking for to fill them five spots. So if you're out there and you're listening, that's what coach is looking for. I was going to ask, you come from Texas, Edwina Brown comes over from TCU, so there's not a professional courtesy that those players who were headed to Texas or that you were recruiting for Texas or she was recruiting for TCU, they're not off limits then? Everybody's uh, uh, fair game? Well, if they haven't verbally committed and they hadn't signed, it's open game. It sounds bad. I wouldn't say I'm the type of coach that will, would do that, but if I'm re recruiting a young lady, that means obviously I have a relationship with them and their families. So my courtesy would be to put that call in and tell them what my next move will be. But after I tell them what my move has been for me to go from one school to the other, I would absolutely tell them that has no bearing on whether or not I want you to play for me. I've always wanted that. I know I've sold one particular program, but here I am at another one. If it's me that you're trusting that I will get you to the next level, then consider it. But I definitely want you to take a look. Don't come just because. Come, take a look at what it is that the university has to offer, what my coaching staff has to offer, and make your decision. How much, as you, as you and your staff hustle to put together your first class, how much of your list of target players is based on the makeup of the current roster and your initial thoughts about needs at different positions and how much of it is simply best player available? Everything we do is based on needs. Best player available is not necessarily in my coaching philosophy. Best, Who says she's the best player? Best player of where? In the rankings? Well, who's making the rankings? I learned this from Gino. Gino said you pick the player that fits what it is that you need, whether Travis, that's your style, uh, whether that fits your philosophy, but don't chase the rankings. That means you're recruiting a player to please other people, and that may not do anything for your particular team. So if I'm going to listen to someone, the man who's absolutely dominating women's basketball, he gave me that nugget. So therefore, your specific needs, meaning... If I know I like shooters, that's my philosophy, I'm going to look for shooters. If I know I like 94 feet man-to-man -man defenders, whatever it is, then that, that would be the need that I try and feel immediately. Are you getting any rest and sleep at all, or are you the kind who's going to burn the candle at both ends year-round? Well, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm so glad to see my staff would be all in the office because it was me in here for two straight weeks and um, there wasn't much sleep being gotten. Even when I did lay it down, it was your mind is running, you're trying to get so much done and there's so much to figure out, so much that's unanswered or need to be closed. And you know when things are open-ended, there's no way you can rest. So this, the work is never done. So, But there's task that needs to be started and finished and there were so many open unfinished tasks that's the thing that keeps you from sleeping